So the topic is introduction to peripheral vascular disease. You will see a lot of patients in your practice, whether you uh, go in a hospital or you are in an office setting. You will see a bunch of these patients who have peripheral vascular disease. They won't come out and tell you. So most of you are much, much better than us in terms of taking history and physical because we as surgeons, we tend to just focus on what we are called for. And for you, the primary management is basically taking a history and physical because patient may come with some other symptom, but they tend to have other things. And so a lot of these patients who you see will have peripheral vascular disease. So what are the things to know and how to get to these patients or what to do is the question. So etiology of peripheral vascular disease. Basically, it's plain atherosclerosis, thrombus formation, ischemia, uh, limb pain, and impairment. So, you must have studied that for other things too, for MI, stroke, for peripheral vascular disease. The etiology is pretty much the same. It is atherosclerosis, the platelet activation, and it eventually leads to peripheral vascular disease. Major manifestations. Uh, you will see these patients will present with ischemic stroke, with TIAs, myocardial infarction, which you tend to see, especially when you are in hospitals, when you are doing these, uh, taking care of these patients. Any patient with history of MI or history of TIA has unless and until otherwise proven peripheral vascular disease. Usually, you have to rule out a peripheral vascular disease because it's good in overall picture for the patient. You may take care of the acute problem, but in the long run, that's what you need to focus on because that's what is going to be patient's subsequent problem. Because if they come with MI, they'll get a coronary stent or they will get a cabbage and they'll go home and they'll be fine till they come back and present to you with dead leg or gangrene of the toes. Similarly with these stroke patients. So the idea here is to just keep your perspective broad on even on these patients who are who present with acute problems. Um, so coming to prevalence, as you know that uh, acute coronary syndromes, the prevalence is significantly high. You can see in this table that the prevalence of peripheral arterial disease is also pretty significant. So one in four Americans uh, have some form of cardiovascular disease. Probably this is going to be one in three pretty soon. And cardiovascular disease accounts for more annual deaths than combined cancer, infection, and trauma. Now, I think the only thing that has overtaken in these, this subset is cancer. Because people have been living longer. Cancer actually has become the leading cause of death instead of myocardial infarction. It's something to keep aware, uh, to be aware of because you will get these patients in your office or even in the hospitals. Cost of care, don't have to say. Uh, it is very important to identify uh, and that's where I think you play a critical role. If you identify it earlier for the patient, it's much better for the patient, much better for the system, overall better for revenues better for everyone. If you identify it late, it becomes more difficult to treat these patients. It becomes a significant burden on the cost care, not only on the patient, but overall health care. So, and this is very common. Doctors often overlook arterial disease in limbs. And this was in the New York Times. This and this is here in this country, which is an advanced country. So if you can go back and see in some of the countries that are third world, or the people don't even look at that because people don't have the money to spend. Usually it is out of pocket payment in a lot of countries, unlike here, where the federal government spends a lot of money, especially Medicare and Medicaid, and to the point that these systems are abused. So survival becomes important. You know a patient 
with peripheral vascular disease, with intermittent claudication, you can see how the mortality of these patients are. So if the patient has critical limb ischemia, you can see that it's significantly lower. Once you know and these patients untreated, especially medically, not even surgically, if they are untreated medically, that's where their survival falls down. So it's important thing to remember because if you want a patient for the rest of your life, which is 30, 40 years of your work, you want to keep them better in health. And so you want to avoid them being dead in 10, 15 years. So it's responsible for significant amount of admissions as we see here in this hospital too. Uh, and it, it's directly or indirectly related to significant amount of deaths per year. So as you see, the prevalence of PAD increases with age. As the population gets older, uh, the prevalence keeps on increasing significantly to the point that it is so high in patients who are 80 and above. Do these patients need to be treated necessarily? Not necessarily. Do these patients need to be treated medically? Yes. All these patients need to be treated medically. They may not need to be treated surgically. So just to keep them healthy, medical management is the key in these patients. So relative five-year mortality, uh, significantly higher, 44%. Patient with bilateral above knee amputation, whether it is peripheral vascular disease or not, if it is peripheral vascular disease, for sure, the five-year survival rate is close to 20 to 25 percent if the patients land up getting bilateral above knee amputation because of bad peripheral vascular disease. So now coming to the risk factors, the most important risk factor that we can correct is smoking. And that's predominantly the worst factor. What are the other risk factors that can be altered? Diabetes, hypertension, and the subset of patients that is most difficult to treat in peripheral vascular disease are patients who are smokers, to top that they are diabetic, and on top of that they are end-stage renal disease. If you have a patient who has end-stage renal disease who is on hemodialysis and is diabetic and comes to your office or hospital with an ulcer, you can be almost sure 90% of the time that this patient may land up getting amputation within the next two years. They are the most difficult patients to treat because they are extremely calcified and whatever procedures we do, whether we do endovascular interventions or we do surgical intervention, irrespective, the vessels are so calcified the inflow as well as outflow that whatever amount of blood we give whichever way they tend to land up losing extremities so don't I'm, I'll just tell you that people when they refer the patients to vascular surgeons especially this subset of patient and I have been resident and I have been a student and I used to say why did they do bypass when they wanted to after two weeks they are saying they're gonna cut the leg off what is the point of doing a bypass uh, there are two reasons why we do bypass. One is to give benefit of doubt to the patient. The second is it depends on, and I shouldn't say this, but business is a part in medicine, unfortunately or fortunately, and it lands up to that. But if you ask what is the right thing to do, a lot of these patients, the first choice is amputation a lot of times especially patients with calcified vessels end stage renal disease smokers and diabetics all combined not one or the other family history plays an important role kentucky people who are going to stay in kentucky the the significant factor that can be modified is tobacco smoking this is one factor which really is the problem with most of the patients. So as I said, the major modifiable risk factor is patients. Patients who smoke more cigarettes actually have a higher risk. Who smoke less cigarette have lower risk. That doesn't mean that they, because most of our patients when we give them 
uh, when we tell them stop smoking, they come back and tell us, doctor, I, I cut down my cigarettes. It's all or none phenomena. It's not that you can cut down and your risk is decreased. Your risk decreases the day you stop smoking. So you have to calculate from there on. High cholesterol, uh, I think you guys do this on a regular basis. You will see a lot of patients who are who will have high cholesterols, triglycerides, LDL is elevated, HDL is much lower. This is your bread and butter. For you guys, you have these are diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. Those are bread and butter in internal medicine. If you have patients in that group, those are the ones you need to focus on because they will stay lifelong with you and with the medical management, you will create a significant impact in their lives. Diabetes, higher risk. Again, diabetic patients tend to seem to do much much worse than just patients who are smokers with normal arteries. Patients who are diabetic uh, also develop a significant amount of calcium buildup in their vessels. There are two, there are only two subset of patients that really have calcified vessels, diabetics and end-stage renal disease. Those two set, subset of patients are very difficult to treat because their end, which is the outflow vessel, we don't have anything to give blood flow to. So those are the ones to really focus on. Now, standardization of classification. Uh, you don't need to know the standardization, but some of you who will go to cardiology, what will happen is you will be asked on and off, especially if you go on trials, if you decide to go in a hospital setting and you decide to go in trials, you will be asked about task classification. And there are multiple ways you do, for your purposes you don't have to know any of these classifications it is more so for us in terms of how do we manage these patients so typically a task A or task B lesion which means 5 centimeter or less than 10 centimeter single level occlusion or stenosis we can treat it mostly with endovascular similarly type 2 lesions can be treated mostly with endovascular. As soon as you try to go in, I don't know what happened there. As soon as you go to type uh, C and D, those are usually better managed by surgical treatment rather than medical options. So this is more for us. But it's good to know what is the task classification. Task classification is the way we classify wound or the, the pathologies to decide what will be our intervention. Now, diagnosis. This is where it will play a key role for you guys is how to diagnose that. Usually patients who come with other problems, they will complain of claudication pain. They will complain, so what is claudication pain? Claudication pain is pain which happens at a set particular distance which is repeatable which means that every time patient walks one block they will say that I get tired and they will stop and this pain can be improved with rest because once the patient rests and gets a little time to rest down then they can start walking back so claudication pain when you start knowing claudication pain depends on what does the patient do is the patient active? Is the patient someone whose lifestyle depends on walking? Because you may have a nursing home patient who may just walk a little bit to a, his, the rest, just using restroom. And if they have claudication, I'm not treating that because that's, it is pointless. You have to know, you have to treat claudication pain in a young, usually young patients or even in older patients who have capability or who are have a lifestyle that needs walking first thing though for you as treatment of choice as being an internist you always have to say that I will refer you to the surgeon if you need to only if you stop smoking because if you do that what happens is if the patient will I mean realistically though you will have to refer if the patient requests that 
I want to be referred to a vascular surgeon. Realistically, you will have to refer because otherwise they'll go to a different primary care. But ideally, better for the patient is if you can convince them to stop smoking, that's the first step, and then I will send you. So claudication pain, rest pain is pain which is present at resting, which is present every time. It does not depend on movement, which is usually relieved by putting the limbs down and in a dependent position. And when you see a limb which is red, especially a lot of times, I do get counsels back and forth saying cellulitis. That's truly not cellulitis because those patients have what is called as dependent rhubarb. That's critical limb ischemia a lot of times. So not everything that is red and looks red is cellulitis. And you will see that in your practice because patient won't have any fever, they won't have any tenderness, they'll just have redness in their foot and they'll say it looks red. But they will complain of claudication pain or they will complain mostly of rest pain. It hurts all the time. They cannot ambulate at all. That's rest pain. Now, wound healing, by the time you have a wound, now you are looking at trouble in these patients because now you are looking at salvage you are trying to salvage this extremity for the wound. So you still are in the game when they have claudication pain. As an internist, your purpose should be to keep them in that range if possible, not let it get worse. How can you do that? With your medical management. Control their hypertension, control their diabetes, control their hypercholesterolemia, stop their smoking. Those are the key factors. And statins. For every patient, statin has now, it is proven that it is something that stabilizes plaques. So we, even when we do carotid surgery, and there's a lot of time you will get these patients who are operated by surgeons. General surgeons will always stop aspirin, plavix, a lot of times. We need 10 days. For us, we need it to continue till the day of surgery. Now. This is the new concept. If you do meet someone who is 55 year old or 60 year old vascular surgeon who was not used to that concept, they will stop that plavix and aspirin. That's not right though. In the current thinking, the right thing is even if the patient bleeds during surgery and you have to spend half an hour or one hour more trying to get hemostasis, the risk of stroke is much lower keeping them on antiplatelet agents. I will almost keep them on almost every vascular surgery except for open AAA repair where I would keep them only on aspirin because that's the only place where you are opening up significantly the retroperitoneum where the bleeders become much more difficult to control. That's the only surgery that I would just keep them on aspirin otherwise they need to be on dual antiplatelet agents most of the time, most of these peripheral vascular patients. So now this is something again that w what do we do if I get a patient of peripheral vascular disease now that I, have, I don't feel pulses. If you don't feel pulses, do you feel the groin pulses? Yes, I do feel the groin pulses. So because in office you don't have Doppler in every office. You cannot go in Doppler and make sure that the, the patient has pulses. If you don't have dorsalis pedis, but you have a bounding posterior tibial, you are bound to do nothing. Basically, you don't need to do anything because a lot of these times, these patients are okay. There is only one condition where the patient consistently comes back saying that they have claudication pain and they do have palpable pulses. The only test that will actually rule that out, non-invasive test, will be an ankle brachial index with without exercise. You need to exercise these patients because at rest they may have palpable pulses but when they exercise which means they for five minutes they are asked to walk on treadmill the stenosis becomes apparent because the blood flow tries to increase as you are exercised and where the stenosis is you will have decreased flow right at that point and your ABI will drop with exercise that's the only place that you really need an ankle brachial index with without exercise so if you have palpable pulses in both lower extremities at the level of the feet, 
and just one pulse. Not if you if you don't have dorsalis pedis, that's fine. But if you have a palpable, not dopplerable, if you have palpable one pulse those patients will usually not lose their limbs and they are okay. They don't need most of the time workup unless and until their history is consistent for claudication and still palpable pulses. That's the only place where you may need with without exercise. The other ones, bedside tests that you can get done and this you will do because I know my wife is a primary care and so she gets patients in their office and you always put blood pressure cuff in both arms in every medical or medicine office and when if you have differential in pressures that's when you know and that's when you know that there is something going on with one arm usually the left one left subclavian artery stenosis is common patients who are asymptomatic do not need anything to be done you just need to be aware if you want to document, you can document by doing a carotid duplex actually on them. If it is a high grade stenosis or occlusion of the left subclavian artery, the finding that you will get back is retrograde blood flow in vertebral arteries. Because what happens is, if you have occlusion or stenosis, your words from the other side will give flow to the ipsilateral side. And that's why you will have a reverse flow. So it is for document purposes that you can document. I do get because she tells me I had this patient with differential blood pressures. Uh, do you need to see this patient? And I will tell her no. If the patient has symptoms, I will see the patient. If the patient doesn't have symptoms. What are the symptoms? Patient will usually complain that their hand gets tired, especially when they do activities like putting things up on the top, uh, hanging clothes, stuff like that. That's when they or they have numbness, pain in their hand that is persistent. Those are the symptoms usually we watch for subclavian artery stenosis. So blood pressure cuffs, blood pressure cuffs in the lower extremities, you won't get that chance in your offices. But if you want to get a quick, if you don't have Doppler, and if you will need a Doppler though for this, if you don't, then you cannot do that because uh, you can do an ankle brachial index in your office. I don't know if you can really bill for that. That billing part I don't know because it has to be officially read by someone, which can be you, as long as you document it and put it on paper. Because those things can be billed for. Uh, so ankle brachial index, you put two blood pressure cuffs in the upper arm, two blood pressure cuffs in the lower arm just above the ankle. The highest brachial pressure to the highest pressure in the, at the level of ankle. That's the ankle brachial index. So if it is 160 here, 140 here, take 160. If it is 80 here and say it is 100 here, take the 100. That's the ankle brachial in, or 100, and eight, 100 in dorsalis pedis and 80 in posterior tibial, take the dorsalis pedis which is 100. So highest ankle, highest brachial pressure, that's what the ankle brachial index is. Um, what is the next test that you will usually order in these patients who have peripheral vascular disease is ankle brachial index if you don't have it in your office and ankle brachial index with segmental pressures a lot of times I've seen medicine guys order arterial duplex of lower extremities if they suspect peripheral vascular disease not true not right don't get that test done cumbersome technologists hate it they almost say why did the doctor order don't they know or they will almost say that they should get ankle brachial index it is cumbersome test to do arterial duplex because they really have to measure the velocities and it's much longer than just plain ankle brachial index so when they do ankle brachial index with segmental pressures you actually get much more significant information even more than arterial duplex. The reason being is arterial duplex is very tech dependent. Ankle brachial index with segmental pressures is not that much of a tech dependent uh, study because they will use the segmental pressures. I'll show you examples in the... N anyway, symptoms. Coming back to symptoms, the most common region is femoral. Uh, for us as surgeons, and it's not for you but for us as surgeons the most important artery in the right or in the lower extremities is 
profunda femoral artery it's not common femoral it is not superficial femoral profunda femoral artery if that is open we know that most of the time the leg will be okay because you can have common femoral occlusion you can have superficial femoral occlusion and patients will have minimal symptoms sometimes no symptoms if they are well collateralized but if their profunda goes usually they will have symptoms because if the profunda goes it's relatively always spared artery if the profunda doesn't work or the deep femoral artery does not has calcifications or thrombus the superficial femoral artery usually is diseased so that's the most important artery for us so in diabetics also the profunda femoral artery is spared the peroneal artery is spared you don't have to go through the anatomy or know the anatomy but this is just uh, on the side uh, so always remember if you have patients who complain of buttock claudication or thigh claudication it's always one level above where your blockage is if they do that then you have iliac or aorto occlusive disease if you have and th the commonest ones that you will get is i get charlie horses or i get cramps in my legs when you ask them it is their calf muscles and that's the commonest it is superficial femoral artery where the problem is it's in the between the groin and the knee it's usually superficial femoral artery stenosis or occlusion so patients have significant cramping of their calf muscles if they start complaining of foot pain it is usually tibials but by the time they have foot pain they usually have multi level disease to the point that they will have rest pain so is so classification would be again asymptomatic those are the best patients if you can get them eventually as we grow older we will get patients who are peripheral as i showed you that as you grow older the risk or chances of getting peripheral arterial disease is higher you will get patients with intermittent limb claudication not all of them need to be treated the only ones that need to be treated are people who have or patients who have a lifestyle that is worth treating because you don't and there's a lot of times that we treat uh, a nursing home patient and they'll say oh he has rest pain what does that rest pain mean he doesn't he doesn't ambulate the guy is on bed it is pointless to treat those patients you are wasting resources you may get a result out of it uh, technically but it is pointless if it doesn't help the patient so rest pain usually they will dangle their extremities um it is not leg cramps at night which lot of patients oh it's in the night it's usually not those leg cramps it is persistent pain they will dangle their foot down and they will say when i elevate it it makes it worse on physical exam you will see loss of hair especially in these patients they will not have any hair okay it's not a female it's a male by the way <laughs> so loss of hairs you will see that um you will I, at this i mean in this age i don't think we pay that much attention to these much of details nail thickening and shiny thin skin you don't do that this is good for books but for practical purposes uh, you should know the only thing is that you will see less hairs you won't be paying attention to most of it color obviously as i told you dependent rubor or if it is pale those are two things that you will notice so you can see that picture of dependent rubor this is how they look and they will consult me cellulitis left lower extremity consult cellulitis and when we go there it is critical limb ischemia actually with dependent rubor uh so well we don't want to wait for this but this is what we see a lot of times with our university patients the reason being is university the group of patients that we get are the patients who do not take care of them medically to begin with they are very non compliant the biggest non compliant risk of patients or the the patients that i found in my practice who are the most non compliant are patients with end stage renal disease they are that's the reason they have landed into end stage renal disease they are the most non compliant and so anyway 
the point was do not wait for amputations to happen you have to start working before you have a result like this yeah if they don't work they won't claudicate so I mean if this patient was walking there is treatment for this you can treat this won't heal just taking the toe off you will have to do most likely some form of bypass because there is arterial disease here based on unless and until this patient was in hospital and it is just embolization or decubitus but majority of these patients will have some form of peripheral vascular disease it can be treated you have to take the toes out before you do that in a dry gangrene you want to make sure your vascular uh, system is well established if they have wet gangrene which means you enter the room or they come to your office they smell there is a foul smell the first thing is to take that infected portion out and then do the revascularization later uh, this was again the ankle brachial index what is important in ankle brachial index numbers to be known more than 0.9 normal if it is more than one it is not necessarily normal because of calcinosis or calcification especially in diabetics and end stage renal disease how do we decide that we decide that based on waveforms on segmental pressures this number 0.9 to 0.7 is mild peripheral arterial disease moderate is 0.7 to 0.5 and severe disease is less than 0.5 if it is less than 0.3 if the patient has ankle brachial index less than 0.3 he needs immediate at attention in terms of saving his limbs otherwise this patient is likely to lose their limbs so 0.3 and below is a critical limb ischemia that needs to be addressed pretty quickly if uh, it, if you know that it is 0.3 or less now this is a busy slide but this is these this is what we look at the segmental pressures um, and on the segments so if arm pressure was 120 at the level of the thigh it should be 30 or 40 millimeter mercury more you should have 150 or 160 at that level and right at the ankle you should have a pressure of again 120 which should be same as the brachial pressure so what the segmental level does is if I know that the pressures are lower so if this if brachial pressure was 120 and at the level of the high thigh it was 120 I clearly know that there is disease in this segment because this pressure should not be equal to the brachial pressure there is some form of stenosis most likely rather than occlusion which probably may need to be treated that's the reason why the patient came to you for so in patients who so exercise becomes imp, sorry exercise becomes important the problem with peripheral vascular disease is you cannot actually put them on treadmill a lot of times these patients have coronary disease they are bad peripheral vascular disease you probably have no you have to chemically induce stress in most of these patients and this is what I was saying is pressure drop is accentuated by exercise and it is very flow dependent so minor stenosis of the SFA or superficial femoral artery minor stenosis in iliac arteries will not be picked up unless and until you do or you ask them to do an exercise study uh, physiologic testing again non-invasive much easier you definitely need to know this the things that you need to know about peripheral vascular disease for your practices is that there are a lot of patients this is the key test because physiologically it gives you an idea how much blood flow is coming it is non-invasive uh, it can be done in almost every small town or hospital uh, ankle brachial index can be done anywhere a ankle brachial index with segmental pressures can be done even in small towns the problem is it does not differentiate if it is a stenosis or occlusion and it is limited as I said by presence of calcium and pain obviously when they have pain you cannot really get a good anatomy you don't need to know that but in general just know that for 
for all practical purposes this is the most important artery for us all practical purposes this artery peroneal artery is the one that is paired in most of the patients with peripheral vascular disease so even if you don't have a palpable pulse dp or pt when we say we as long as they have peroneal and they have collateral flow they will maintain their leg that's what we need to know is if they'll maintain their limbs as surgeons what is the most dominant flow in the foot usually is posterior tibial is the dominant blood flow in the lower extremities it is not dorsalis pedis it is posterior tibial in majority of the patients so intermittent claudication 75% remains stable and this is the subset of patients that is abused the most this is where you will see unnecessary procedures done by a lot of vascular surgeons or surgeons um, and this is what you want to avoid as an internist that your stable patient who is stable you can tell them you will send the counsel but you have to coordinate with your vascular surgeon and tell him also that you know what i send him because he's stable but i just want him to follow because a lot of time if you send me a patient i pretty much think that you have sent it with the intent to treat unless your intent is not to treat try to keep them in that group you want to keep them medically healthy uh, there is a risk of amputation which is very low and when the ischemic pain happens most will progress pressures usually are less than 40 mm of mercury the ankle so what is the ankle brachial index is less than 0.5 it's a red flag vascular surgeon yes absolutely ankle brachial index 0.5 to 0.7 yes plus minus depending on what the patient is 0.7 to 0.9 your field try to keep them there pressures i'm not going to go into what two pressures we look at but there is especially in patients who have abis 0.3 or less the risk of amputation is tremendous 20 to 30% risk of amputation toe pressures why we do toe pressures is because in patients who have calcified arteries all we look at is toe pressures it should be usually the toe brachial index should be 0.6 or more if it is less than 0.6 that means that there is some form of vascular disease it may be microvascular below the level of the ankle it is technically more difficult let me see so pressure will drop at approximately 50% narrowing that's when they start getting symptomatic um i don't think the rest is important calcified arteries to know is non compressible especially in your diabetic patient and your end stage renal disease patients three phases in a uh, segment pressure waveforms systole diastole systole usually you won't get such a pretty picture in most of your duplex uh, when you get it done uh, this is an example of moderate left iliofemoral stenosis uh, i'm not looking at pressures right now i'm just looking at just look at the at the tracings and you can see compared to this this is the amplitude is lower as well as the waveform is lost so you can see outright right on the top itself there is a problem so you don't even have to go down here to look look at the pressure here abi is 0.7 abi is 1 so this patient 0.77 you actually can manage him medically a lot of times now unless and until this is a young guy who works walks or a older guy who walks a lot this may need to be treated because and the good thing is the bigger the arteries are the easier they are to repair because the resistance is lower peripheral vascular resistance is lower as you go down in the extremities towards the hand the resistance gets higher and higher so it is easier to fix iliac arteries but it is much more difficult to fix tibials uh this patient example is so if you see waveforms it started at 148 155 155 165 this should have been closer to 170 clearly there is a drop here and you can see that in the amplitude of the waveform 
So you know that if there is a significant drop here in pressure, you have disease that is right there because the rest of the pressures they just are same. So there is no tibial disease in this patient. There is disease right in the femoropopliteal segment. And there may be some iliac disease too. It depends on where the cuff was put. Because it's lower right here. It's 148, 155. I would expect it to be 170 out here. Multi-level disease, on the other hand, those are the difficult ones to treat. Um, on this patient, so 190, if you see the ankle brachial index is 0 0.32, this is non-compressible. Look at the waveforms. The waveform actually is better here than here. So this definitely, above the popliteal you have disease, you know that. The waveform is not perfect, mild disease at the level of femoral or aorto-occlusive, moderate at the level of popliteal or distal superficial femoral artery and moderate to severe at the level of tibials because it becomes totally flat. Exercise testing again causes vasodilatation. Uh, there is always a protocol for exercise testing. It varies from lab to lab. Uh, so normal ABIs it looks like here it says normal ABIs. Is there, is that the whole story? Do we need more information? Ask the question. And that's why the segmental pressures are done. Here, the waveforms pretty much look okay. You won't get that pretty picture where you get systole, diastole and systole. But if you see the waveforms are pretty much okay except in the right popularity it's slightly decreased but that too also is not significant. This is what, when you go in your office, these are the lab or the way usually you get reports. You will get report, impression, no evidence, arterial insufficiency, no significant ischemic response, evident on the right leg after exercise. So it depends. Th these are kind of reports that you will get. And they will have, a lot of labs have this down there. That way you, you know. Anyway, treatment options. Coming to treatment options, medical treatment, as I said, risk factor modification, exercise, medications. Risk factor modification, big, num big one, big plus is smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, aspirin, antiplatelet agent, uh, comorbidities, which you will take care of. This is key, increased physical activity. Uh, it means minimum of 30 to 40 minutes three times a week that the patient has to ambulate. It's not like a leisure walk. You have to go a certain distance. Um, when to intervene in peripheral arterial disease when there is a lifestyle modification. As I told you, depending on, it does not matter what the age of the patient is at that point. Critical limb ischemia, definitely rest pain, non-healing wound or gangrene it needs to intervene. This clearly needs intervention. This depends on how the surgeons or how the medical guys play that game of saying, oh, this is lifestyle limiting. And so that's how you can change your indications for surgery if you want to. What we do in terms of revascularizing these patients is either endovascular approach or surgical approach. Endovascular wise, we, the balloons that we use, simple thing is plain old balloon is all you need. You don't need to, I mean, f in terms of treatment, I won't go into too much of details, but balloon angioplasty, where you just go open up the occlusion or stenosis and stenting depends on whether it is a bare metal, whether it is drug eluting. We don't have drug eluting stents. It's in the market now, just recently, but we don't have drug eluting for peripheral per se as yet that is being used. It is just approved recently. It is good for, it has been approved for coronary a long time back. These can be expensive, depends, but you have to know the details as to whether they are expensive or not because sometimes this may be a better option than, be, anyway, not for you, for me. So again, when we decide on these interventions, we decide on the task level also. If it is a smaller lesion, if it is a smaller 
I mean, the length of the stenosis or occlusion is less. You you can treat it with these endovascular procedures like balloon angioplasty, stenting, or etherectomy, which is called the rotor rooter. I have almost stopped using the etherectomy because what I have found with clock is that after we do the etherectomy, most of the time we do balloon angioplasty at the end of it. If you just do etherectomy, most of these patients will come back within set eight to nine months back with the same complaints. So it takes out the plaque, but it does not, it still does not treat it in terms that it is, it causes an injury in the intima where it reforms the plaque much faster than what it took years to form before. So percutaneous treatment options, examples, iliac artery, that, those are the perfect ones. I mean, if I am a vascular surgeon and I want to treat vascular disease, this is what I would want to treat. I would love to treat this because the, uh, it's very easy to treat, first thing. Second thing is the patency is much, much longer because once you put stents in the iliac artery, the patency is 90% for five years. So I don't have to worry. But unfortunately, this picture is not very common. Usually, the pictures that we get, so this is anyway, I think this is post picture after the stenting, you can see the difference, you can make a difference significantly. Patients immediately feel better, they feel better for the next few years and they are always, uh, always thankful to you. Can we treat long chronic occlusions percutaneously? Yes, we can. Is that right at this time? I don't know, I don't think so. but. Are there times when I treat it? Yes, I do treat it depending on patient's morbidity, patient's request. There are a lot of things that will play once you get out into private practice. Is there is there You will figure out what you read in books in terms of right and wrong may not necessarily be true when you go out in practice. There are a lot of changes and it will clash between what you believe in and what you don't believe in. Anyway, long segment occlusions they can be treated too. This is an example where the wire catheter is being passed, balloon is being worked, and then the whole. You don't get this kind of pretty picture. This is good for a presentation, but usually that's not the scenario in long segment occlusions. Um, iliac occlusions, again, these are, these are the commonest ones. Superficial femoral artery occlusion. If you can get a wire pass through that, the problem that you can see is if you are getting your catheter and wire, the wire is going to try to track this collateral. What you have to do is you have to go through here and go down with the wire. So you have to be aware when you treat, uh, at least for us, we have to be aware when we treat this. But it can be treated. You have to have that facility available at your place, wherever you practice, that the person who does these interventions can treat it endovascularly as well as open. Because usually people who have both the skills know when is the time to open. I'm not going to criticize cardiology, but I'll tell you the problem there would be that, that they would treat it only percutaneously because they do not have the second form of intervention. They cannot surgically treat these patients. So they will always say, oh yes, I can open up this long segment occlusion, send the patient. And they can, and the results can be good. But what we have seen in terms of long term results is usually long segment occlusions are better treated with bypass than with endovascular intervention. But again, when you go out in practice, world is different, there are different ways of practicing and it is difficult to to practice the way you really have been or you really have studied. You have to make changes based on where you are, the environment and how things work for you. So I mean you can angioplast you can angioplasty all these vessels, basically open it just with plain balloon and now you can see if this patient, I mean if I saw this picture, I would I would see this dissection, I would probably stent it. That's what I would do as a surgeon or even a cardiologist for that matter. But for me, the advantage is I can open and do a bypass. When I see a long segment occlusion, I will not try to waste three hours of trying to pass my wire to go through that occlusion when I know that end result will be two years of patency. I would rather do a fempop bypass where the patency is much longer. 
wildly variable. Um, this is what most of us face as vascular surgeons is the FEMPOP challenge. This is where most of the patients fall in. If it is tibial vessels, usually tibial endovascular intervention is actually not bad for tibial vessels because doing a FEM distal bypass is much more difficult than doing a FEMPOP bypass. Like this tibial for example, it's gone at the level of the ankle, you can go down, the wire is almost going to come out through the skin almost looks like, but you can go down, your wires can track down almost to the tip of the digit if you want to and this is after angioplasty. Again this is, I mean these are pictures that can be treated easily, they look good, whether they work good, we don't know. Anatomically, what you see or what we see as surgeons, we always follow it with, so if you get a patient, and I will just tell you that if you get a patient who have these vascular disease, just make sure that post-op there is ankle brachial index too. You want to see the result because the only way to see result is ankle brachial index. You started with 0.5 and now if it is 0.5 and the picture looks good, that means there is a problem still. Patient will come back with symptoms. So always get a post-op ankle brachial index too. Surgical bypasses, again, that's for more for us. The conduits usually, vein is a better conduit. Autologous conduits are best. Synthetic bypass grafts don't work longer. For a FEMPOP, it is okay above the knee. They have a patency of 50 to 55% for two years. For below the knee, the patency drops significantly to 30% one year patency with a synthetic graft. So you are below the knee. If you have a surgeon who you are referring patients to and who is doing regularly a fem below knee bypass with a synthetic graft, you want to cut out that surgeon at some point. You need to know those finer points too when you are in practice because end result is the patient is yours. They will come back to you and they will tell you that why did you send me to that surgeon? Because he did a great job but within six months I have been back with the same problem. So, you have to pay attention to these minor things too, just to know how to take care of your patients in terms of, and, and the most important thing is medical management. You get them onto a medical management regimen, most of these patients will do okay. Problem here with medical management is patients are not compliant. That's where you lose the game. If you get the patient compliant, you will have a better practice. That's it. Do you guys have any questions? Go ahead. Segment pressures are done in vascular lab. They cannot be done in your office because if you are trying to set up that, you can. I know of internists who have a vascular lab in their office because it's a very lucrative business. It is because you have a bunch of, and especially in Kentucky, Indiana and these places, a lot of internists have a vascular lab in their offices, and but they have, they need to read it or they need someone to read it. It is, it is absolutely reasonable as long as you know that it's same person or someone who you rely, who's doing the, who understands what brachial and I, unless and until you are doing it yourself. The, the cuff is placed above the ankle. And when you do, when you measure with the Doppler, you measure the dorsal speedis as well as posterior tibial. In 10% of the world population, dorsal speedis is absent. So, the, the posterior tibial you have to take both and whatever is the highest. So you do both. If you don't have the other, I mean, nothing to worry about if you have only one. Ideally, you should check both. And whatever is the highest one, you take that as ankle brachial index. 
No, I don't think so. That's what I said, that you probably may not be able to do an ankle brachial index too because you may not have a Doppler in your office. I'm just saying when you go out in private practice, I know of offices that do have that, that have the capability of doing that. Not only to that point, they have the capability of running a whole vascular lab. They hire vascular technologists. They go and do a course which is called as registered physician for vascular interpretation. You just have to pass those exams. It takes you about a week or two weeks to read for those. If you have given your internal medicine board and you have passed it, the RPVI is nothing in front of that. But you have to put effort still. Any exam is an exam. So for us, the best way to help us, I think if you don't have the ankle brachial index, but I can understand where you're coming from. So history and physical first, that's the key. It is in your situation, it is okay or it is better to even refer things that you are doubtful about rather than being the perfectionist that, oh, this is okay. That you start be becoming a perfectionist only when you have certain things running and certain experience. So in for people who don't do regularly or don't have Dopplers but the history is suggestive, even if it means it's a console which is cold and which is, it is always safer to play on the safe side than to just disregard. I, I really, I mean, I don't know what else to answer in terms, if you, if you do suspect that and if you really want to help me, you can order ankle brachial index if the patient is in hospital. Now, if the patient is outpatient, obviously, you probably will refer to office. But if it is inpatient hospital, you can always ask for ankle brachial index. So by the time I come, I have an ABI, so I'll just go for the CAT scan. The next step I will do is CAT scan. Because what am I looking on CAT scan is anatomic imaging so that I can treat it. But I don't do any more diagnostic angiograms. Almost maybe 2%. Diagnostic angiograms are almost never needed now. When you do angiograms, it's mostly for therapeutic reason. Because a CAT scan is a great tool to find out everything if you want. The only problem with CAT scan is 200 cc of contrast. Diagnostic angiography may take only 30, 40 cc. So if you have patients who have CKD, chronic kidney disease, you may want to actually just do a plain angiogram if you still suspect that's a problem. Yeah, segmental pressures are difficult to do because it is cumbersome. First of all, you need someone to put five blood pressure cuffs. It takes time. It is good lucrative though, but you need someone who is dedicated to just do that. You are just there to read them. All right, good. No questions. It's good. <laughs>